I'm Beth O'Shields. I'm the administrator here at Unity Spiritual Center of Portland. We are very pleased to host this event this evening, and we're so glad that you all came. At this time, I would like to invite Alicia Scholes up here, and she is going to introduce the main event. Thank you, Beth. What a beautiful setting. Um, I'm Alicia. I'm a volunteer with the Marianne Williamson campaign. Um, yeah. And you can be too. I'm so excited we're all here in Portland together uh, to see Marianne on the campaign trail. Um, you, know, you may know Marianne from her best-selling books, her lectures, her humanitarian work, and her political activism. Marianne founded Project Angel Food, a nonprofit organization that has delivered more than 16 million meals to ill and homebound people since 1989. <laughs> the group was created to help people suffering from HIV and AIDS. She has also worked throughout her career on poverty, anti-hunger, and racial reconciliation issues. And in 2004, she founded the Peace Alliance and supports the creation of a U.S. Department of Peace. Yeah. And now, of course, to introduce Democratic presidential candidate for the United States, Marianne Williamson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you to Portland Unity for giving us this opportunity to be here. And thank you uh, to all of you truly for giving me this time, lending me your ear, your heart, so that all together uh, we can go someplace uh, within our own consciousness, within our own hearts, and within our own minds uh, that perhaps certainly together we have not been before. We all know the line from Einstein where he said that we would not solve the problems of the world from the same level of thinking that we were at when we created them. And nobody here needs to be reminded that we have serious problems in the world. So in asking ourselves, what is that other level of thinking? Well, I love the fact that we're in a church. I love the fact that we are in a place where a deeper level of understanding is looked for, is sought, and is expected. You know, Gandhi said, Mahatma Gandhi said, politics should be sacred. And by that, he didn't mean, you know, religious. He didn't mean dogmatic. He didn't mean doctrinaire. He meant exactly that. He meant that it should come from a deeper place within ourselves. Some of you might have read a book by Dr. James Doty. He's a neurosurgeon at, Sam, at Stanford. And he wrote a book called Into the Magic Shop. He has another one coming out next month, actually. And <clears throat> I heard him talk about the fact that they used to think that the brain was the intelligent center of the body, but that now they are beginning to recognize that there is a highway in the body between the brain and the heart that was previously misunderstood, and that they are realizing now that it is a partnership between the brain and the heart that is the main driver of the intelligence of the human body. Well, I submit to you that it's a partnership between the brain and the heart that is also the main driver of intelligence within human civilization. And the... <clears throat> So the problem with our society is that collectively we are not driven by that partnership. Now that's not to say that we're not driven by that partnership in our own personal lives, because many of us are. In fact, I think the vast majority of people in our society, as I believe the vast majority of people in our world, are people who have decency and intelligence, uh, who, who want the world to be a loving place. and yet. You know, you could take any two people 
uh, in this room tonight who don't know one another. And the room could agree, you guys go out to dinner later, okay? I think it's a reasonable assumption that within 30 minutes, those two would know which one was in therapy, which one had had traumatic experiences in their childhood, uh, which one was in toxic relationships, uh, which one uh, had to absolutely set boundaries uh, wherever there might be abuse, and which one absolutely uh, needed to practice greater self-care. <laughs> and that's because it's now understood that a deeper analysis of me is part of the mainstream. But when it comes to our collective, particularly political conversation, we have been trained to think like sixth graders. We have been trained to farm out our best thinking. We have been trained not to go deep. We have been trained to keep it shallow about things that have to do with our own collective experience. For instance, you're going to draw a line, you're going to have a boundary, huh? About all that abuse that you might be experiencing in an abusive relationship. What could be a more abusive relationship than that your government is allowing carcinogens in the food that you feed your children that other countries would not allow? What about that abusive relationship? Because that abuser comes back around every four years and says, oh, honey, give me another chance. And we are in the habit of saying, okay, one more time. And I'm running for president because I think the problem is on us at this point if we give that machine another chance. <laughs> So if we are going to go deep and we're going to have a deeper conversation that's going to allow us to come up with deeper solutions, we're going to have to ask deeper questions. You know, in our own personal lives, you individuate, you mature, you go to therapy, you do whatever you do, and one of the questions that you start asking yourself is, where do I come from? What's my family system? Who are my parents? What's the history of my family? What's the history of my people? Where did all this begin? And you begin to look at what you inherited from other generations and you go, that I like, that I'm going to try to embody at even a higher level and pass on to my children. And other things you say, I don't think so. Uh, that one stops with me. That will not be passed on. And so I'm going to ask that you join with me tonight and I want to talk about our collective experience. Now, let me say also, when we talk about how a different kind of thinking is necessary in order for us to solve the problems of our time. You know, Martin Luther King said, we need quantitative changes in our circumstances, but we need also qualitative changes in our souls. So the question at this point is not just what do we do? The question is who must we be? Who must we be, number one, in order to be able to even discern what it is we need to do? And number two, who must we be in order to be able to effectuate what it is that we feel we need to do? So the reason we don't have deep answers in this country is because collectively we haven't been asking deep questions. So that deep questioning has to do with a deeper level of understanding. So let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to 1776. Now in 1776, some very brave men, 56 of them, signed the Declaration of Independence. And our Declaration of Independence is our national mission statement. It's our North Star. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said, it is an eternal rebuke against all forms of tyranny and injustice. But the issue with this mission statement is that it's not enough if the principles of the Declaration of Independence are just inscribed on marble walls somewhere or written in parchment. And when our kids are in the eighth grade, we send them to Washington, D.C. to go to some museum and see it under glass. In the Jewish religion, it said every generation must rediscover God for itself. And every generation of Americans must rediscover the principles of the Declaration of Independence for ourselves. What do they mean for our time? Because if those principles are just on parchment or marble walls, but they're not inscri inscribed on our hearts in any given generation, then they lose their life force. They lose their moral force, and we become easy to play. 
Because if this stuff isn't embraced inside us, then the idea that we're going to farm out our best thinking to people who basically could care less about those principles if it does not, in fact, serve their ideological or financial purposes, then that means that we, the people, have not only forgotten in too many cases what our rights are, but also what our responsibilities are. So let's look at those principles. They were radical 200 years ago, and they're radical today. 56 men signed that document, and I said that they were brave. And the reason I pointed out that they were brave is because if the British had won the war, they would have all been executed as traitors. And they knew that. Number one, all men are created equal. Radical then, radical now. Remember how radical it was then. That is a complete repudiation of centuries in which the idea that everybody should get to thrive is ridiculous. What do you mean all men are created equal? The second is even more radical, radical then and radical now, that we are given by our creator inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I think in today's language, that would mean self-actualization. Do what you want to do. Anybody who makes you happy, go on and do it. Spread your wings, be who you want to be, do what you want to do, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. That that's a God-given right. Radical then, radical now. Gets even more radical. That government is instituted to secure those rights. Not undercut those rights, not chip away at those rights, not diminish those rights, secure those rights. And then the most radical of all, if the government's not doing its job, it is the right of the people to alter it or to abolish it. Now, with those principles, <clears throat> those are our primary first principles. John Adams said he hoped that we would revisit them every July 4th. Now, with the signing of the Declaration, a space of possibility was opened. My friend and I were talking today about portals. It was a portal of possibility for the human race. Never fully actualized, never fully actualized here or anywhere else. But it is the ideal that theoretically every generation is to imbibe in order to realize that's where we get our rights. But it is also in every generation our responsibility to protect those principles, to protect them from any assault, from anyone who would undercut them or undermine them, and to the best of our ability to expand them so that they have greater and greater universal application. Now, that's what happened in, in 1776, but we're also not stupid. Because out of the 56 men who signed that document, 41 of them were slave owners. Now, stay with me here. What does that mean? That's our characterological DNA. That's the American story. There is a bipolarity to American consciousness. It means that we have been from the beginning, and I hope that you will consider tonight that not only have we been from the beginning, but we have been in every generation, including ours, both and. That is the American consciousness. We have always been the best and the worst that humanity has to offer. <clears throat> On one hand, every generation from the beginning, willing to struggle, willing to sacrifice, and in many cases, willing to die, filled with those whose hearts so get the importance of this, not just for us, but for this country and for the world, that people are willing to sacrifice, struggle, and die for those principles. And then there have been in every generation forces who, for their own ideological and or financial purposes, had no intention whatsoever of seeing those principles made manifest and have proven over and over again that they would do anything, even the most heinous or atrocious things, to make sure that they were not. So then you ask yourself, well, how did other generations handle this? And then you look and you go, wow, there's a lot to be impressed by. Because a generation rose up and they repudiated slavery with abolition and the Civil War and constitutional amendments. 
A generation rose up in the face of the institutionalized suppression of women with the women's suffragist movement and the passage of the 19th Amendment. A generation rose up in the face of the first Gilded Age and the inherent financial inequities thereof with the establishment of organized labor. And in the face of the institutionalized oppression of black people in the American South in the form of segregation, a generation rose up with the Civil Rights Movement, with desegregation, with the Civil Rights Act, with the Voting Rights Act. I've been running for president for the last year because it's our turn now. We're not going through anything that's new. This is just the newest iteration. This is the American story. Let's not be the first generation of Americans and wimp out on doing what it takes to put this country back on track when there is something so fundamental and structurally wrong and anti-democratic about the way that we are functioning. <clears throat> But this is the deal. It's complicated. Because in other generations, there was a specific institutional reality that was the problem. Slavery, you need to abolish it. Institutionalized suppression of women, pass the 19th Amendment. Other generations, this is a problem, this is the solution. Ours is more like a cancer that has already metastasized. Our opponent is an economic paradigm. It's simply a mindset. It's this viral mentality that has taken grip of every corner of American society, even our government, which posits that short-term profits for huge corporations is somehow more important than your safety, your health, your well-being, your planet, and the people of the world. <clears throat> And that mindset is held and it's embodied in a matrix of corporate powers. It's a matrix of corporate overlords. It is the institutionalized greed that is now embodied within insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, big food companies, big chemical companies, big agricultural companies, big gun manufacturers, big oil companies, and defense contractors. They are a matrix of corporate tyranny. Because in issue after issue after issue, our government passes laws that do more to enable their donor class, their donor class being in too many cases, the representatives of these corporate powers, especially since the passage <clears throat> of Citizens United 14 years ago, giving unlimited permission to these corporate powers and billionaire classes to so unduly influence Washington as to have turned Washington into a system of legalized bribery. Why do you think we don't have universal health care? First of all, I want to point out to you that every other advanced democracy has it. Not only does every other advanced democracy have universal health care, but every other advanced country has universal health care. What do we have? One in four Americans who live with medical debt, 68,000 Americans who die every year from lack of health care, 18 million Americans who cannot afford to pay for the prescriptions that their doctors give them, 75 to 90 million people who are uninsured or underinsured. And I'm sure there are probably people in this room who understand the uninsured, underinsured issue. There are millions of people in this country whose insurance will cover the trip to the doctor, but will not cover the test that the doctor wants you to have, will not cover the operation or the medicine that the doctor wants you to have. In no other advanced democracy are there people putting GoFundMe pages on the internet to pay for life-saving operations for themselves and their children and the loved ones. We have 1.3 million Americans who ration their insulin. In no other advanced democracy does this occur. We have Americans choosing between their insulin and their rent. Now, this is the issue 
Why don't we have universal health care? Why don't we have improved Medicare for all that would include eyeglasses and hearing aids and dental and mental health? Why don't we have it? Well, I know what the system would tell you. We don't have it because it's complicated. And I'm here to tell you we don't have it because they're so corrupt. <laughs> so let's just admit it, OK? <clears throat> Nothing but the institutionalized greed of the insurance companies, the pharmaceutical companies, and so forth. Why are there foods? Why are there carcinogens in your food that they don't allow in other countries? They don't even allow it. Maybe you saw that viral thing that was going around a few, a couple months ago about the ketchup bottle in the United States versus the ketchup bottle in Canada. It's this food you're feeding your children. And there are ingredients such as one ingredient that big food companies realized would increase the shelf life of a food. And of course, if it increases the shelf life, it increases the stockholder value. The problem is it's also carcinogenic. We have 46% uh, percent of all the urban wells in this, in this country are filled with those PFAS, those forever chemicals. By the way, I want to say something right now. There's nothing I'm telling you here tonight that you don't already know. There's nothing I'm going to say here tonight. Maybe I'm going to say a statistic or two, but we already know this stuff at this point. The issue is not, you know, if I was having this conversation maybe 10 years ago, certainly 15 years ago, I'd say, wake up, everybody. We got to look at this. There's nobody that doesn't know this stuff now. The issue is not that we need more data collection. The issue is not that we need more data analysis. The issue, we need more courage. That's what's going on right now. <clears throat> I'd like to point out one other thing. A majority of Republicans, as well as Democrats, not as big a majority, but a majority of Republicans, as well as Democrats, want universal health care. They want Medicare for all. They want it. So what, what's going on here? It's because routinely our political system does more, as I said, to enable their donors than to enable uh, the well-being of their own constituents. And the issue goes on and on and on, whether it has to do with the food, whether it has to do with the chemicals and pesticides that we know harm a developing child's brain, whether it has to do what's happening to our farming sec uh, sector, to agriculture, what has happened to our earth, and the resistance, the official resistance to all of the regenerative agriculture and all of the solutions that we absolutely know are available. It's not like we don't have brilliant people in this country who don't know what to do to repair. We have people in this country who know what to do to repair the earth, to bring forth a sustainable energy system, sustainable agriculture, sustainable food. We have the people. The problem is the people with solutions are over here, and the people with power are over here. And the people with solutions don't have the power, and the people with the power too often don't really want to hear about the solutions, because if they really practice those solutions, it would actually undercut the corporate profits which are represented by those corporate lobbyists that are in the offices of these people every single hour of every single day. <clears throat> and it goes on and on and on. It's not just children who are praying every morning, dear God, let me not get shot at school today. It's also parents who are dropping their children off. Please let my child be safe at school today. We can't even have the most common sense gun safety laws because of the incredible political power wielded by the NRA and the gun manufacturers. This is another one that's very interesting. The majority of Republicans as well as Democrats, including gun owners, want more gun safety laws common sense gun safety laws. A majority of Republicans as well as Democrats, not as big a majority, but a majority, want, once again, what they have in every other advanced democracy, tuition-free college and tech school. Every other advanced democracy has it. Every other one, every other one. And by the way, for those of you who are old enough in this room, remember, they used to have it here, too, until the 1970s. They had it at University of California, University of Texas, and University of Florida. That is why we should cancel those college loan debts. And many believe that it could be done using the Higher Education Act. The reason, the main reason we should cancel that college loan debt is because those college loans should never have even existed. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
You know, some people say, some people say, well, you know, we should run this country like a business. No, we shouldn't. We should run this country like a fiscally responsible family. You know what a fiscally responsible family does? You set your kids up to win. You don't cut them off at the knees. <laughs> but, but this was just the tentacles of this malevolent strain of unfettered soul, uh, uh, soulless capitalism that has been exalted in this country, this economic paradigm that has had us in its grip. Some people say it started in the 70s. It definitely came full bore in the 1980s. And I want to remind you that Adam Smith, the main architect of free market capitalism, said it cannot exist outside an ethical context. This is a malevolent strain. You know, in the human body, every cell is uh, filled with a natural intelligence, and it is guided by that natural intelligence to collaborate with other cells in order to serve the healthy functioning of the organ and the organism of which they are part. Every once in a while, a cell disconnects from its collaborative function. It goes insane. It's no longer following its natural intelligence. It goes off to do its own thing. It doesn't want to serve the healthy functioning of the pancreas anymore. It doesn't want to serve the healthy functioning of the lungs. I want to go off and do my own thing, and I'm going to get other cells who are similarly forgetful about their natural intelligence, and together they form a tumor, and that is a malignancy in the body. And that is exactly what has happened to the human race. We've been infected by malignant consciousness. It's all about me. That is a malignant consciousness. We were not born to just be about me. We are born to collaborate with one another in order to serve the healthy functioning of that which is bigger than all of us. And all of our systems, <clears throat> all of our systems, we know in our own individual lives, everybody here knows, you know, whether you got there as secular means, spiritual means, personal growth, whatever. When you're not trying to be a more loving person, a kinder person, a more compassionate person, a more forgiving person, owning your mistakes, trying to do better, your life doesn't work as well. So the same consciousness which guides a life that works better is the consciousness that guides public policy that works better. But instead, the majority of public policy in this country is in the service of an economic system which is all about a very selfish, unethical, soulless perspective that all that a corporation's responsibility is is its fiduciary responsibility to its stockholders. And that was sold to the American people back in the 1980s, and it was like a veil put in front of people's eyes. It was this unbelievable PR canard telling people, this will be good, see, because we'll put all the money that we can into the hands of the stockholders. Now, remember, that was at the expense of other stakeholders, other stakeholders like the workers, other stakeholders like the community, other stakeholders like uh, the environment. But this was going to be good, see, because the stockholders and the CEOs who can now be paid with stock options and all the changes they made, this is going to be good, see, because they're going to be job creators. And all that money then would trickle down and lift all boats. And people bought it. And so what happened was not only did it not lift all boats, it kicked millions of people off the boats that they were already on, and it's left millions of people in the ocean without even a life vest. And why is that? Because their business model was never job creation. Their business model is job elimination. Their business model is worker exploitation. Their business model is the demonization of unions, and their business model is slashing taxes for the very richest among us. What has come from that over 50 years is a 50 $50 trillion transfer of wealth from the bottom 90% of Americans to the top 1%. Now, some of you are young here. Tell me if you're under 30. Raise your hand. Okay. Kids, I have something to tell you. <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about a long ago and far away land. It was called the 1970s. Now, 
some people in this room are old enough to remember. Now, when you hear about the 1970s, those of you who were not there, you probably intellectually know that what I'm about to tell you is true, but it's going to be hard for you to even imagine. But the older people can actually say, uh-huh, because we remember. Are you ready for this? I'm going to describe this long ago faraway land. You ready? The average American couple could afford a house. The average American couple could afford a car. The average American couple could afford a yearly vacation. The average American couple, if they wished, one parent could afford to stay home with the kids. One salary could support a family of four. And that average American couple could afford to send their kids to college. That was in the 1970s. You know what that's called? A middle class. That's called a thriving middle class. You cannot have a thriving democracy where you don't have a thriving middle class. So we have shifted so much money into the hands of a small group of people, there is an ever-shrinking group of Americans who have easy access to quality health care. There is an ever-shrinking group of Americans that has easy access to higher education. We have been trained to expect too little. We've been trained to expect too little so that if they give us crumbs, we're all excited. Thank you, Master. Thank you. And we have one party that doesn't even pretend. They just throw crumbs. And we have another major party that says, we'll give you cookies. You can't live on cookies either. So it's not enough. We have been just trained to think, well, I guess we can't have those things that they have in every other advanced democracy. So what is it that we have? Now, I'm going to say this one. And I don't know if you've heard the statistic before. You probably have. But it's one of those things where I'm going to ask you, don't just take this into your head. Please take this into your heart. 39% of Americans report that they regularly skip meals in order to pay their rent. What? We have people in poor neighborhoods in this country, and there are way too many of those poor neighborhoods, who are routinely selling their blood plasma in order to pay their rent. We have 70% of Americans who say that they're living with chronic economic stress. A majority of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And a majority of Americans cannot afford to absorb a $1,000 unexpected expenditure. And then they wonder where all this anxiety and depression comes from. How could this not be a, a mental health crisis? That co constant chronic economic anxiety day after day. OK, so now I talked to the young ones before. Now I'd like to talk to those of you who are older. And I'd like you to join with me, please. And I want you to think about, just get it in your mind's eye, who you were in your, 19, in your 20s. OK, you see in your mind's eye who you were in your 20s? Could you have handled tens of thousands of dollars of college loan debt when you were in your 20s? Would you be who you are today? I mean, debt is crippling at any age. The 20s are hard for every generation. And by the way, kids, they're not a mental health crisis. They're not a mental illness, but they're hard. And you're going to add to that tens of thousands of dollars worth of college loan debt. And what do these kids do? They were trying to better their lives. I thought that was the whole point here. And not only is that the way people are just trying to self-actualize, there's a particularly heinous racial element to that one. Because young people of color particularly were told, that's the way you're going to close the, the wage gap. You're going to close the wage gap by getting an education. I have talked to so many young people. So they came out of college. They had, they're saddled with these college loan debts. They do the math. And at this rate, it, I won't be, it won't be till I'm in my 50s or 60s that I will be able to pay back this debt if I go into the field that I got my education for. Now, if you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, or beyond, you know that the space of time between your 20s and your 50s is like five minutes. But you don't know that yet when you're in your 20s. That seems a long time. So a lot of these young people are saying, I'm not even going to get a job in that field. I want to get a job in a field where I will have more of a chance to get this burden off my back, maybe in my 30s or 40s. 
And then they say, well, why did I even bother to get the college education? You see, this is how the tentacles of a particularly soulless form of, of capitalism. Now, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an anti-capitalist. This is a strain of unfettered, soulless capitalist that actually is like a heat-seeking missile for anywhere there's a profit center. So the place where there's mainly a profit center is where people are desperate for something. Oh, people really need their insulin. Jack up the price. People really want to get educated, create a college loan system. All that was was the unholy alliance of these lending companies, educational institutions, and the U.S. government. So at what point, at what point do we realize that's the system today? The system is not going to disrupt itself. It's like if you have a friend who everybody knows is drinking too much, everybody knows is doing too many drugs, and friends and loved ones come together and say, we've got to stage an intervention the American people need to stage an intervention. <clears throat> now, please remember, I'm talking to you from the belly of the beast. I know all about it. I've run for president twice. And uh, as bad as you might think it is, I'll multiply that by 10. So I'm not talking to you as someone who thinks this is easy. They have it locked up. But uh, this is what I say to myself, slavery had it locked up too. And the abolitionists unlocked it. And the institutionalized oppression of women was locked up too. And the suffragists unlocked it. And the Gilded Age was locked up too. And with labor organizers, they unlocked it. And segregation was locked up too. And the civil rights movement unlocked it. That's our job. We need to rise to the occasion. <laughs> Now, as I said to you before, it's not like there are not solutions. There are solutions. And I want to talk to you about the solutions, and then I want to talk to you about how institutionally resistant the system is to our actually effectuating those solutions. We need an economic bill of rights, as Franklin Roosevelt called it. Franklin Roosevelt said that there's not just freedom of, there's also freedom from. There's freedom of religion, freedom of speech. He said, but there's also freedoms from want and freedoms from fear. He said, a necessitous man is not a free man. He talked about an economic bill of rights. An economic bill of rights would mean universal health care, improved Medicare for all. It would mean complete cancellation of the college loan debt. It would mean tuition-free college and tech school. It would mean subsidized child care, which is such a crisis for so many American couples. It would mean universal paid family leave. It would mean guaranteed sick pay. It would mean a jobs guarantee. And it would mean a living, guaranteed living wage. The, the minimum wage in this country is $7.25 an hour. In any major city in the United States, a living wage is over $20 an hour. And we have one third of America's workers living on less than $15 an hour, and a half of them cannot find a place to live. Housing is not just a crisis in this country, it's an emergency. It's an emergency. But we need more than that. We need not only fundamental economic reform. We don't just need a little tweaking here and tweaking there. We have an all systems breakdown on our hands, and we need an all systems response. So we need, just as Eleanor Roosevelt said to her husband, we need more than the amelioration of stress. We need fundamental economic reform. Now, not only on the issue of economics do we need an economic U-turn, but the entire political system, and today it's a political media industrial complex, and the way it operates is very much in line. It's stuck in the 20th century. Now, the 20th century mindset was very different than the 19th, and the 21st century mindset is very different than the 20th. So the 20th century mindset was very mechanistic. It was a product of Newtonian physics. And the idea was that the world is a big machine. And if there was a problem, you just tweak the pieces of the machine. In around 2000, a British physicist named James Jean says, it turns out the world is not one big machine, it's one big thought. 
But our political system is still based on that. It is like if you look at allopathic medicine. So back in the 80s, you know, there was a big revolution in this country in our thinking about medicine, right? And we went from a mindset where you don't feel you need to take care of your lifestyle or your nutrition or your exercise or anything like that. But if you get sick, which almost inevitably occurs if you don't take care of those things, if you don't cultivate health, sickness becomes more probable. But before the advent of the idea of integrative medicine, people just waited. If they got sick, you applied external remedies and you sought to uh, suppress or eradicate the symptoms. In about the 1980s here in the United States, and it started other places before that, we came up with the idea, first people talked about alternative medicine, then they changed the concept to complementary medicine, and they finally landed where it belongs, integrative medicine, body, mind, and spirit. The idea was not just that you're gonna treat sickness, you have to cultivate health. That's why, like, for instance, if you go to Marianne2024.com, you see the whole health plan. It's as much about cultivating uh, health as it is about treating sickness. In other words, the 21st century mindset, we've blown past that mechanistic stuff. The mechanistic mindset has you only looking at externals, only looking at symptoms, never looking at root cause. So the politician that we need now, we need an integrative politicians. We need leaders who recognize that you can't just treat the symptom, you have to look and treat at root cause. And if you have, Martin Luther King said, there are two kinds of peace, negative peace and positive peace. He said, negative peace is where there's no outright expression of violence, but there's an underlying tension and anxiety. Positive peace, he said, is predicated on the presence of brotherhood and justice. What we have in this country and on this planet is a negative peace. And the, the way our political system operates is like the old allopathic healer, that we don't spend our resources on cultivating peace, we spend our resources on the allopathic remedies that we feel will handle violence once it occurs. And the two main categories are, are build more prisons or drop more bombs. That's got to end. It will not end until we, the people, stand up. I'm sorry to say this, but whether they're Republican or Democrat, presidents in the modern era have fallen in line with big oil and they have fallen in line with the military industrial complex. That's why we need a US Department of Peace. <clears throat> Right now we have a military academy. We should also have a peace academy. They play war games. We should also play peace games. We have armies of military personnel. We should also have armies of peace builders. And peace building is an actual thing. Peace building is an actual set of, of skill and expertise. These are the four factors that are the core of peace building. Whether you're talking about a corner of an American city or another corner of the world, if these four factors are present, then statistically they indicate that there will be a higher incidence of peace and a lower incidence of violence. Common sense, all of them. Number one, greater economic opportunities for women. Greater, <laughs> you like that. Greater educational opportunities for children a reduction of violence against women, and the amelioration of unnecessary human suffering. Yes. So, you know, you would say something like, well, don't we have like the State Department to do that kind of stuff? The State Department is, is funded at a fraction of our military budget, which now is planned for next year at $1.5 trillion. You know, I look at the US military the way I look at a surgeon. If you have to have surgery, you wanna have the best surgeon. And the United States needs to have the best surgeon. And we need to have the best surgeon on hand at all times. Remember, this is not the military's fault for what our commanders in chief have told them to do at times. So the issue is that a reasonable person tries to avoid surgery if at all possible. So John F. Kennedy said, humanity will, well he said mankind, will get rid of war, or war will get rid of mankind. But once again, this is what we're talking about here. 
Don't expect the system as it is now to change itself. Too much money is involved. There needs to be an uprising of consciousness. There needs to be a political revolution in this country. There needs to be a massive march on the voting booth. Well, in your case, mail-in ballots, <laughs> right? This is not going to change unless we change it. We need a Department of Peace. We also need a Department of Children and Youth. Children in this country, particularly the youngest children, are the greatest collateral damage of the way the system now operates. I have met, I have met elementary school principals who told me they have students on suicide watch. We have millions of Amer well, I don't know if we have millions of, on this one, but we have many American children, certainly thousands, who are traumatized before preschool. We have in public schools around this country routinely trauma rooms. I remember several years ago when everybody was talking about trauma-informed education, and wraparound services and all of that. And at first I was really excited and I thought, this is great, trauma-informed education, this is so cool and sustainable and hip thinking. And then I thought, wait a minute, we have to ask ourselves, what is going on in this country? That childhood, childhood is such a trauma for millions of American children. So if we want the America that I know all of us would really love to see in 20 years, we need to make a massive shift of resources into the lives of children 10 years old and younger. So much happens. <clears throat> so much happens in those first five years. We now know, you know, 90% of the human brain is developed before, uh, before, uh, before five years old. So at this point, we know so much about the brain, but particularly in early childhood. But the way it is now, I mean, children can't work, so they don't have any financial leverage in Washington. They're not old enough to vote, so they're not a constituency. So the only way we will change the system to be more attentive to our children is if we wake up and we create a society once again in which humanitarian values trump soulless economic values as the bottom line of how America functions and operates. <clears throat> <laughs> because right now, and this is true not only of little children, but it's also true of the elderly in this country. Once we get to a certain age, we don't have any utilitarian function. We're not particularly useful to the system. And I know there are a lot of people in this room who know exactly what I'm talking about, who are having a very, very difficult time on their fixed income, social security, and so forth. We also need to stop America's war on drugs. And let me tell you, and I know that you've really been through a lot here in Oregon. You've been through a lot. People have kept their eyes on what was happening in Oregon. I know you had decriminalization, but then I know you had uh, recriminalization, and I understand why. But at least the view, and you'll tell me here tonight if I'm incorrect, but the way most of the country has looked at this does not have to do with the problem having been an effort at decriminalization, but rather the fact that it was not partnered with the proper other issues of, of um, <clears throat> harm reduction, et cetera. And I know that there are people in this room who will correct me if my thinking is wrong. You know, some of us here remember Watergate, and we remember the inception of the war on drugs. And this came from Richard Nixon. And all those of us who are old enough to remember all that, remember that some of his aides, and including his uh, attorney general, went to prison uh, for their part in the Watergate scandal. One of them who came out, a man named John Ehrlichman, who was a completely transformed human being, and he, he spilled the beans about a lot of things, including Richard Nixon's inception of the war on drugs. Nixon called drugs public enemy number one. He knew that it wasn't, and he was doing this in part to attack black communities. Now, when I was in college, there were 300,000 people in prison in the United States. Today, there are 2.3 million. And of those people who are in federal prisons in the United States, 46% of our prison population are nonviolent drug offenders. We need to treat drugs in the United States the way we treat them, in, they treat them in other countries such as Portugal, as a health issue, not a criminal issue. Most, <clears throat> we have spent, we have spent a trillion dollars 
in the last 50 years on the war on drugs. We spend $100 billion a year now. For a fraction of that, we could be funding a world-class network of recovery options. We don't need a drug czar. We need a recovery czar. It's the 21st century. Right? <clears throat> and let me tell you what else uh, this would do. This would help us at the southern border. Now, the southern border is very much an issue where we need to look not only at symptoms, but at root causes. There are, in terms of, of those who are seeking to immigrate here in such massive numbers from Latin America, there are two main reasons. One has to do with economic desperation. Economic desperation, I'm sorry, much of which was at least in part caused by American foreign policy in Latin America. <clears throat> We need a president who, among other things, compassionately and wisely helps America look in the mirror. We should be willing to help restabilize some of those economies that we helped uh, destabilize, and that includes, by the way, removing the sanctions in Venezuela now, and Cuba, obviously. Now, the other one has to do with the horrifying violence that is perpetrated by the drug cartels. When we dismantle America's war on drugs, this will put a big dent in the power of the drug cartels because their power is driven by the black market of drugs here in the United States. It won't solve the problem completely, but it will put a big dent in it. But these are the kinds of things that are not tweaking things here, tweaking things there. They have to do with making fundamental changes the way other generations have made fundamental changes. Americans are hardwired to do great things. Abolition, my God. The establishment of labor, women's suffragists, civil rights movement. We're hardwired to do great things, and we wilt. We're like wilted flowers when nobody's calling us to do anything great. And I've seen this having run for president twice now. The, and, I, and people asked me last time, they said, what was your experience? And what I'm about to say about last time is multiplied this time. The system, I said, is even more corrupt than I feared, and the people are even more wonderful than I hoped. The American people are not the problem. We are as decent and as intelligent and as noble when we're called to be as any other people in the world. We're no better, but we're no worse than. The problem is we're not called to our intelligence. We're not called to our nobility because the system is predicated on our keeping it dumbed down and keeping us so intensely focused on only our own selves because that feeds their consumerism, which is their idea of economic driving, and because it keeps them safe from any real interruption of what they are doing, even when what they are doing does not serve us. When it comes to the state of the planet, we need to be willing to declare a climate emergency if that's what it takes. We need to not only have a, a just transition from a war economy to a peace economy, and by the way, there is more ROI, there is more return on investment on investments in health and education, which is a peace economy, than there is in the defense contracting industry. And we need to make that immediate mass mobilization just transition from a dirty economy to a clean economy. We have right now a situation where we're all supposed to be, well, it's not that we're supposed to be, we should be, uh, very impressed and grateful and, and happy that there are some very fine investments in green energy in the Inflation Reduction Act. But I'm sorry, it's like a classic purse thief distraction technique, because even though we've made some good investments in green energy, we have made even more investments in dirty. And this president, I'm sorry to say, has given more oil drilling permits than even Donald Trump did, plus he has okayed the Willow Project. We need to have a president about that and many things who says, enough is enough. See, that's what the abolitionists said. That's how we were doing it. We're not going to do it that way anymore. That's what the women's suffragists said. That's the way we've been doing it. We're not going to do it that way anymore. That's what the labor organizers said. That's the way we've been doing it. We're not going to do it that way anymore. And that's what the civil rights movement said. We were doing it that way. We are not going to do it that way anymore. We were not put on this planet as Americans to say, pretty please, William, maybe, kind of, to the point where we are not, we're, we're disgusted. There's no energy. And for those of you who are Democrats, the danger to Democrats in 2024 is not people voting for Donald Trump. People who want to vote for Donald Trump, it's a democracy, they can vote for Donald Trump, they have every right to vote for Donald Trump. Nobody has a monopoly on truth, nobody owns this country. So they have the right to do that. 
and everybody deserves respect for whatever their choice is, the, respect for the fact that there is that choice in a democracy. I'm not saying you necessarily respect that person. <laughs> but for the Democrats, the real problem in, in 2024 is not people voting for Trump. The problem in 2024 for Democrats is people staying home. People staying home or people going third party, which could in fact then elect Donald Trump. Because where's the chi? Where's the life force? So I looked at all that, and I went, this is not going well. And I've lived, you know, I've had a 40-year career. And in my over 40 years, I have worked very up close and personal with people whose lives were in crisis. The joke used to be, nobody calls Marianne because things are going well. So I have had the privilege, really, of being invited into people's lives at some of their very darkest hours. The test results came back not good news, finding out their child is on, addicted to heroin or whatever. By the way, I want to mention something else. When we do have a proper, wise, and responsible end to the, to the uh, war on drugs, it will also give us the focus, give us the bandwidth, and give us the funds to be able to go after the drug we do need to go after, of course, and that is fentanyl. So, so I was... There, you know, somebody found out their child was on, uh, you know, addicted to heroin or, or whatever. Or I was there when someone went through a loss, someone that they loved suddenly died, or a divorce that they didn't expect. But when my career began in the 1980s, my experience of people whose lives were in crisis, and also my experience of this country, was that crises came, but crises passed. The crisis was the exception. The crisis was not the rule. But I began to see something in about the year 2000, which totally makes sense, because that was the full maturation of trickle-down economics. I began to meet people for whom it wasn't just one crisis that would pass. The crisis wasn't that they got cancer. The crisis was that they didn't have health care. I began to realize how many people live in crises that are rolling crises. It's like when President, when President uh, uh, Biden said, well, you know, the end of the COVID emergency, go back to your lives, the emergency is over. For millions of Americans, life was an emergency already. COVID was a screaming emergency. Hunger is a silent emergency. The fact that you have to work three jobs just to put food on the table, this is a silent emergency. And so I began to realize how many people's lives were just, the life was crisis. The life was too hard. Life, just economic conditions, social conditions, it just shouldn't be the case in a country like this. And then I began to realize, oh my God, that's where this country is today. It's a permanent state of crisis. There's always a crisis. It's an economic crisis. It's an environmental crisis. It's a, there's always a crisis. And you can't solve it, which is, uh, you know, we're playing like whack-a-mole. We got to fix it here. We got to fix it there. Then that turned a lot of people off to politics. A friend of mine was saying last night, you know, he, he said, well, we're just going to go around it. You can't leave electoral politics out of the equation, though, because that's where the levers of power are. Now, I understand, believe me, I understand why so many of us have looked at the toxicity of the political system and said, I don't want anything to do with it. But I also understand that everybody here realizes things have gone so far now that we cannot turn away. We cannot afford to be apolitical and think, oh, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to vote every two years, every four years, when those corporate lobbyists are in their offices every single hour of every single day. And so people go, well, I don't want to go into that because it's so toxic, which I understand. But we have to look at our political system like a crisis, like any other crisis that we must learn to endure and to transform. Nobody knows, nobody knows more than I do, the viciousness of our institutionalized political media industrial complex when they see anyone coming in there and trying to get her hands on the levers of power. If you don't fall in line with a corporatist agenda, it's not enough. You know, I noticed four years ago, it was enough to just make out like I'm a joke, right? Oh, kooky lady, crystal lady. This time I saw how serious the system is about anybody trying to actually get in there and change some of these things. Now, I believe, as Franklin Roosevelt said, the main job of the presidency is not administrative, it's moral leadership. 
is we don't, you know, they say, oh, you know, somebody's not qualified. Their idea of qualified is someone qualified to perpetuate the system as it is. Their idea of qualified is you've had a lot of time driving this car that drove us into the ditch. I'm at a point in my life where I think the fact you've been too much a part of that system for too long should almost be considered disqualifying. Yeah. So, so they say, so they think you have to be a political car mechanic. My, my, the way I look at it is the issue isn't that we don't have enough political car mechanics in Washington. The issue is that we're on the wrong road. We don't need another technocrat. We need a visionary. Now, I am not the greatest visionary in the United States, but I am the only one that was running for the Democratic nomination for president. <laughs> so, I want you to know I'm not delusional. I understand that Joe Biden has won the nomination. Well, I don't know, I have a problem with the word won, but I understand that he has the delegates. Uh, he has the delegates and he will be the Democratic nominee. Absolutely. So you might say, well, then why are you here, Ms. Williamson? And I'll tell you why I'm here. Because we still got to inconvenience some of these people who really deserve to be inconvenienced. <laughs> Their whole thing is to get you to shut up. Their whole thing. See, if you really want to talk about fundamental change in this country, and I remind you, I've said it here more than once tonight. Everything I've talked to you about tonight is considered a moderate position in every other advanced democracy. This is not, you know, it's like, but they, the, what they, the, the links that they will go to to make sure that you don't hear an anti-corporatist message, they, the links that they will go, uh, character assassination, smears, hit pieces, psyops, kicking you off ballots, canceling events. This is not funny, actually. I'm a big girl. I can go on with my life, but you need to know. We all need to know. But you know what? If anybody would have an excuse and a reason to be cynical, I think I would. And I'm telling you, we must not. That would be their ultimate win. That would be their ultimate win. So I believe the answer is for us to become the people we need to be to do what needs to be done. We have to purify our own hearts to do that. First of all, we have to come out of our silos. You know, on one hand, what is your religion? What is your sex? What is your sexuality? What is your, uh, what is your ethnicity? All of that. What is your race? It's important. And there are times when that's absolutely the appropriate question. But we have got to come out of our silos now because we need to remember the word that comes out of the height after the hyphen, black American, Jewish American, gay American, young American. We've all got to come out of our silos. You know, there's a, <clears throat> there's a concept in alchemy called separatio. And it's that all of the elements are separated out and perfected but they're perfected just so that they can come together at a higher level. One of the first principles of the United States is e pluribus unum, out of many, out of many, one. We are all those different identities, but we come together because of our fealty to certain common principles, even on age. I don't care in this room if you're 18 or 80, I'm talking to you. Because at this point, it's not just about people my age, my religion, my whatever. We are all adult Americans. And when people would ask me, who are you talking to? I'm not talking to particular groups. I'm talking to a place in our hearts. A place where we feel what I believe most Americans do feel. An instinctive understanding that this country matters. This country matters. And don't you tell me politics doesn't matter. Tell Iraqis. Tell a million people. A million who died. Iraqis who died because of the Iraq war, and you tell me that who's elected doesn't matter. We have a responsibility here. This is not just about my rights, my rights, my group. This is about a very sacred responsibility that we have here. Now, I reminded you at the beginning that people have died for this. After the battle at Gettysburg, the battle at Gettysburg was the decisive, determining battle in the Civil War. It was the battle after which it was clear to both sides the North was going to win. Abraham Lincoln 
traveled to the battlefield, and he gave his famous Gettysburg Address. In referring to the Union soldiers who had died in that battle, he said that they had given their last full measure of devotion so that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people would not perish from the earth. I'm here with you tonight to submit to you for your mature consideration. It's perishing now. It's perishing on our watch. For functional purposes, we are a government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. As I said, their short-term profits come before your safety, your health, and your well-being. If this country is to be in our hands, this conversation has to be in our hearts. And we have, to, we have to begin to see political activism of the kind that we believe in, that is not angry, that is holding systems accountable, yes, but not individuals. Not every rich person in America is a greedy bastard or anything like that. This is about systems. There are some very, very, very wealthy people who might even be in this room, but certainly in this country, who would agree with everything that we're talking about here. This is about holding systems accountable. And we do know that sometimes love says no. So I agree with Martin Luther King. He said, external circumstances have to change and some internal shifts in our souls have to occur as well. He said that the, the desegregation of the American South was the political externalization of the goal of the civil rights movement. He said the ultimate goal was the establishment of the beloved community. So Gandhi said the end is inherent in the means. We're not going to pull this off if it were coming out of anger or out of judgment or out of blame. When it comes to the smug, self-righteous, arrogant, angry, casual lying about people, all of that stuff, I'm sorry. It's on the left as, long, as much as it's on the right. All of us have to wipe that smugness off our faces and us wipe it off our Twitter accounts and wipe it off our hearts. We have to change on the inside and on the outside. We have to transform our lives and transform the world. It has to be a big both and. Now, I have a motto that works for me. I'm gonna share it with you. It might mean something to you. You might tweak the language, it might work for you in whatever way it does, but it works for me, so I share it with you. Pray in the morning and kick ass in the afternoon. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Would you like to do a little Q&A and conversation and comments? Would you like to do that or would you prefer not to do that? Okay, first of all, I want to invite Alicia uh, Scholl and Mark Van Landor to come up. You know, I mentioned you before. I'm, I'm not here because I'm asking for your vote because I could win the Democratic nomination. That's not what this is about. Between May 1st and May 21st, you will, have, you will be able to write in. We have gotten about 400,000 votes. Now, those 400,000 votes is tiny if you're talking about actually winning the nomination. But if you have a close election in November, 400,000 votes is 400,000 votes. If we had a parliamentarian system, the kind of thing that we're talking about, we could be in there, we could be in the conversation. So every vote that, if you believe in the kind of agenda that I was talking about here tonight, Every vote, we're, why, are, why would you vote for Marianne Williamson? To raise some eyebrows. The system is so, is so smug, and it so believes that they've handled it, and that there isn't anybody who, who is really gonna say anything more about Medicare for all, or who's gonna say anything more about tuition-free co uh, uh, college and tech school, or who's gonna say anything more about Department of Peace and so forth. So, for those of you who see the value in that, uh, I appreciate it. I want you to remember that I will be in Bend tomorrow night, and then th the next day I will be in Eugene. Uh, I hope you will go to Marianne2024.com, look on the events pages. I want to introduce you to Mark and Alicia, and they'll tell you real quick what you can do uh, to uh, help make it happen that we raise some eyebrows and inconvenience the right people uh, with the way Oregon uh, weighs in after all.
Give it up one more time for the one and only Marianne Williamson. All right. So Oregon, you're gonna be receiving your ballots starting May 1st. Now, how many people here are independents? That's a lot, okay. Please, to vote for Marianne Williamson, please register to become a Democrat for this primary. Now, that includes their Republicans as well? Republicans as well, of course. And for everybody, please register before April 30th. Do it outside in the lobby. We're there ready to register you so you can vote for this remarkable woman for this incredible agenda. It's really important. And then you can, and then you can become an independent or Republican the next day. You, you can go right back. We won't be upset. We won't be upset. And also, please, for all of you who want to establish that beloved community, we have a team here in Oregon. Please volunteer, please become part of it. Please share. This voice is the most important voice in this election. Marianne Williamson's voice must be amplified. In all your social media networks, please do so. And join us in the back, volunteer with us. Yes, please see us and the table back there. Sign up to be a volunteer. We're gonna have a Zoom call together to start organizing, to rally and get the word out for Marion Williamson. She's on the ballot, she's right there, and it'll make a huge difference, send a huge message. So please, it'll be a lot of fun too. So join us as volunteers. That today my friend and I went out to lunch and we saw the flyers uh, that were out on so good on you, good on you, thank you. Also, I want to uh, make a little comment. W what, what are they doing right, right in the business, the undecided? How are they doing it here in Oregon? So there is no uncommitted on the ballot, but there are some people, well-meaning people, who are advising people to write in uncommitted on the write-in space. Those votes will not be tallied. If you want to vote for a voice, if you want to vote for this agenda, Yes, if you're voting for a ceasefire, vote for Marianne Williamson. If you're voting for a U.S. Department of Peace, vote for Marianne Williamson. Everything that you've heard tonight, universal health care, a living wage, U.S. Department of Children, this is what this country needs. We need to make sure that this voice is amplified. We, we need your votes in Oregon. And with that, Beth is going to uh, walk around with the uh, microphone if you have questions. And Alicia, hey, you want to say something, honey? Oh, I was just going to say that it's important to, to get as many votes as possible because of the delegates. Because what? The, do you want to talk about the delegates? Oh, delegates. well, yeah, be, well, this is the deal, guys. We'd have to get 15% in a state to actually get delegates. It would be really hard to get 15%. Because we're, you know, I'm at about like four to five percent in most places. The institutional resistance, the things that have happened in this campaign, it's not okay actually the way things happen. But I don't want to go back. I want to go forward. Uh, so I mean, to get 15 percent would be really amazing. This is this is the way the system is. It's so rigged that only those with huge amounts of money or access to huge amounts of money can get anywhere near the pinnacles of power in this country. That's how it works. So in my case, for instance, I was blacklisted this year on CNN and MSNBC. Last year, I had a CNN town hall. This year, it was an edict. Do not let that woman get a viral moment. You know, that was very, uh, and I, and I, Mark has said, and I agree with him, that's journalistic malpractice uh, for mainstream, mainstream media platforms. <clears throat> you know, the traditional role of, the, of a political party is to stay in the background. The people, the voters, are to determine who the nominees will be, and then the, vo the political party is going to come forward. In his farewell address, George Washington warned us about the overreach of political parties, which are not mentioned in the Constitution, remember. He said the political parties he feared would form factions of men more loyal to their party than to their country. And John Adams said he saw, he saw them as the greatest risk to democracy. Some of you might remember and be aware, after the 2016 election, some ex-Bernie supporters sued the DNC. They sued the DNC for having put their fingers on the scale for Hillary. 
In court, the DNC argued, hey, we're not a governmental agency. We don't owe it to people for it to be a fair election. And they won with that. They won. So then they started not even pretending. So that this time, their narrative was, oh, well, we have an incumbent. So Miriam Williamson is just a spoiler. Well, seventh grade civics, you can't be a spoiler in a primary. And this idea that you don't primary an incumbent, back to us older ones, Lyndon Johnson was an incumbent president. Eugene McCarthy primaried him. Bobby Kennedy Sr. primaried him. Nobody thought it was weird. We thought it was democracy. And it was very important that Eugene McCarthy primaried him, because even though he wasn't going to become president, that opened up the conversation about ending the Vietnam War. So you can't just curate. They have no right. It shouldn't be just a few minutes. It's like we've gone back 100 years. Tammany Hall politics. A few people who think they have the right to sit around at a table smoking cigars, I guess, deciding who the nominee will be. And I was really disappointed by the codependent relationship that so many Democrats, smart people had. Oh, it has to be Joe. It has to be Joe. It has to be Joe. And I don't mean that with any disrespect to the president, by the way. It's not about him personally, although he could have picked up a phone and said, don't do this, but that's, that's different. <laughs> at, at this point, that's not right. It, to me, candidate suppression is a form of voter suppression. And so for me, that's why even though I suspended because, you know, well, they got me and I can't, I realize, no, every state where we're on this ballot, and I know for those of you uh, who have donated to my campaign, and I'm so grateful to those of you who have, to those of you who have been volunteers, you got us on this ballot and we're using it. We're on this ballot and we're here. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, thank you. So Alicia, Alicia will be, and Mark will be in the back. And uh, Alicia, you're gonna have a Zoom call. Do you know what night you're gonna do it? Um, this Thursday. This Thursday? Yeah, Thursday at 5 p.m. Sign up to be part of the volunteer uh, organizing Zoom call. And get a bumper sticker and put it on your car and get a pen and join us. <laughs> yeah, yard signs. Thank you, thank you everyone. Okay, and thank you Mark, I love you guys, thank you. Uh, if you, thank you, yes. Thank you. All right, if you would like to uh, ask a question, if you'd like to comment about something, bring up a topic, uh, we can certainly do that for a few minutes. Yes, sir. <clears throat> do, do we have a second mic, Mark? I don't know. Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you, Marianne. I'm, I'm pleased to hear you saying the things you're saying. You. If I were in your position, I'd be saying them too. Here's a question. Okay. What form do you see kicking ass taking? One thing is voting for me uh, between May 1st and, 20, and 21st. Uh, you know, raise some eyebrows. Uh, help us get, I, we've got up to 9.1% in Oklahoma. That was our highest. Uh, but, uh, you know, come on, you can beat Oklahoma. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if you got to 15%, uh, then I could, uh, I would have delegates. I would be able to go to the convention and have a voice there. But it's more obviously than just one campaign. And it's more than one candidate. Uh, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi was asked, who is the leader of the Indian independence movement? And his answer was, the small, still voice within. So what you're supposed to do, uh, God's not going to tell me what you're supposed to do any more than he's going to tell you what I'm supposed to do. And that's when I said pray in the morning, whether you meditate, pray, whatever your, it's secular, religious, spiritual, whatever, we, we, we are assaulted constantly by such a cacophony of ultimately unimportant stimulus. It's eating away our minds. It's eating away our society. And we all know this. This is back to, this, to that. We all know this. We all know we need to put the phone down more. We need to talk to one another more. We need to educate ourselves. I think what's happening in the, in the country and in the world today, it tempts all of us to just want to attitudinally get into bed, put the covers over our heads, and just kind of tune out. We can't afford to do that right now. We can't afford to do that right now. It's like I said, we have to start seeing some level of activism. It's simply a layer of a well-lived, meaningful life. 
So the thing is, you know, it's like I've said all year, I would say, I'm not like a politician coming in here and saying, oh, send me to Washington to fight for you. That is so not my idea of a good time. <laughs> but I wanted to go to Washington to co-create with you a new chapter in American history. <clears throat> <clears throat> And for that to happen, that's not just forces that we have to deal with in Washington. We have to deal with it on the local level. We have to deal with it on the state level. Look what just happened in Arizona. So, you know, you have to be as active. None of us can sit this out. This is not one president that's going to fix it. It's not 100 people who are going to fix it. And by the way, those of us who are old enough, we know how the system handles it if just a few people are carrying the dreams of a generation. It's got to be an uprising of consciousness that's just in your neighborhood, in your field, whatever field you, you know, it could be your family, it could be an organization. And everybody in this room knows. What could, if, if I said to anybody here, what could you do that would be showing up at a higher level? It already came to you. <laughs> and, and we've got to stop... You know, look, I wrote some of these books, so I understand the, the importance of some of it, but we've taken it too far. We've got to stop. How are you? How's your wounding today? What trauma are you dealing with now? <laughs> we need to start asking each other, what great thing are you planning and how can I help? That's the kind of question. <laughs> We have really got to grow up. You know, we, all, we always say that there's something so sad about a child never having a chance to have a childhood. There's also something pathetic about an adult who never becomes a grown-up. You know? So enough, enough, enough. A question we don't over get to here? wait until we're enlightened masters uh, before we show up for the world. Yes. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm uh, heartened that... We're having a Zoom call this Thursday. I'll be there. Thank you. But we know that we have to have somebody to come back to to share what are we doing today that's great. Yes. And that's what I'm concerned with is do we get some way to do that, not just through this election. It's oh. going to be four years or eight years. It's a long struggle, and it means something deep to the kids here. I won't be there, but you will. And uh, can, can you give us some idea? Is this well, the reason I, I put my arm around Alicia was because I think organized? Alicia... Get Yeah, well, absolutely. She's going to hold a great space with you uh, from now until May 21st. Okay. And you'll build, and you'll build... Listen, this is Oregon. You have a lot going on in Oregon. Uh, there are all kinds of organizations and cool things happening. I'm sure a lot of you are already very involved in things. It's not so much what do we do as, you know, one of my favorite gospel tunes is Use Me. When you wake up in the morning and that's your consciousness, how can I help? It's, it, it's, it's all around you. Books will fall at your feet. Friends will say, do you want to go to a meeting that you would have said three weeks before? No. You know, we've got to start seeing city council meetings as the new hot date on Thursday night. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it, 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 pardon? But then coming together to acknowledge one another for doing it. Well, I don't know about if you're looking, just looking for approval or acknowledgement, no, that's an, yeah. I'm looking for organization. Well, but hold on a moment, if I might. Um, the human body, it's an internal organization. Uh, I, I think, you know, whenever you get into too much organization, it's dense material reality. That's where the corruption sets in. Every person, something happens organically. When people just sort of rise up, you find yourself talking to more friends who are into the solution. You'll just find yourself less interested in people who just want to talk about unimportant things. Do you know what I'm saying? It's all there. I mean, it's a metaphysical principle. Everything you're looking for is right there. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. Oh, I failed. <laughs> well, this is... Okay, what is your name? Jim. Okay, Jim, yeah. on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to acknowledge you for the fact... But you won't be here next week. To it. But it's yeah, not. But we, no the person. The no will be. Yeah, she's going to be here. And yes. no individual, listen, everybody, no individual is indispensable to any of this. 
And also that's a way to distract from our own responsibility. So, uh, and the person that we most need acknowledgement from is the person that you look at in the mirror at the end of the day and you can go to bed knowing somebody's life is gonna be better because of something I did today. That's the most important acknowledgement of those. <clears throat> Give him a lot of acknowledgement. She's your, Thank you, I Jim. Sign you. And you're wearing a t-shirt from Mary Ann okay. 2020. I love that, I love it. <laughs> Who's next? Okay, back there. <clears throat> Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can I shake your hand? Hi, oh my God. Nice meeting I you. Mean, <laughs> somebody take a picture of this real quick. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Give me a minute here, because I really want to ask you this, and I want it to come out right. Um, okay, so it's not like I'm some social media analyst, but you know, I follow you, and I've been paying really close attention. My mom raised me on you, you know, like I'm right there at that age where, you know, I feel like split with what you're talking about as far as the age ranges and things like that go. Okay. And I like the bull fan, and you're talking about these moments, these unlocking moments, you know, all these eras. Um, abolition with slavery and the suffragist movement and everything like that. And so I'm going to go to the end real quick and then come back. Um, you're talking about getting blacklisted from CNN. And so the connection that I'm seeing is this, like, grassroots like I'm seeing all these kids on TikTok and um, Instagram, and there's there's like there's this whole other market basically of communication and things like that, and I and like you said, like your your this position is like very moderate in any other advanced democracy, and you're we're the, talking about this unlocking, and I'm wondering if we can move forward without looking at those moments and being like completely honest about. Part of the reason why we have this malignancy now, the way that I see it, is because in all of those moments, those critical moments, we failed to do so much by so many important people. You know, like the um, abolition, you know, we, like, a, like we failed to tell towns in the South that they were free for, like, years after, you know, we won that um, abolition. Oh, tell me your question, honey. Okay. So I'm saying... If we don't fully own for all of the groups and all of the people that we left behind, like white suffragist women, you know, who trampled on brown and black women and Latina women and native women and stuff in the suffragist movement, can I get thank you, right? Like we need to go back and make those things right and make those things whole in order to move forward. And I see you having like this really radical, like even more radical and like propulsive movement forward if we can like, start to like fully embrace the fullness of that story. The, the, <laughs> listen, it's not really other generations don't owe you anything. Past generations don't owe you anything. Past generations were trying to keep their own heads above water. Now, the one issue uh, uh, that I do agree with you on is why I believe we owe a reparations for slavery. That I do, and that is core. Uh, <laughs> but. For everything that America has done wrong, I mean, there's a level, you know, on one hand, we do need to identify, and I think Americans are identifying such things as you just said, and we're identifying the genocide of Native Americans, we're identifying a lot of things in our past, but I think we need to do more than identify the problems, we need to identify with the problem solvers. You know, there are some people in the United States who have no listening for the things that we've done wrong. They only want to talk about what we've done right. And many of us are turned off by that. It's so unbalanced. But there are other people today who only want to talk about what we've done wrong. And they have no listening for what we've done right. These were human beings, just like you. We've done some things wrong. We've gotten some things right. But no, I don't think we can spend all our time going back to every single movement. People within that movement need to understand that. I think, for instance, the one you mentioned, we do get that. But Susan B. Anthony was a person of her time. I'm not gonna spend all my time feeling horrible about Susan B. Anthony because she wasn't as enlightened as perhaps. I, 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 we can't just always be like everything we did was wrong because not everything we did was wrong. Well, let's remember some of those women who marched for suffrage uh, were put in prison for having done so. 
And the conditions in those prisons were so awful that they went on a hunger strike. And the response of uh, the prison officials was to send men into their cells who forced these metal contraptions onto their necks to force feed them. Now, I, I, I think I want to honor some ancestors more than I want to demonize some ancestors. They got some things wrong, because let me tell you something. The real question isn't where they got it wrong. The real issue is how are we doing? How are other generations after us going to talk about us before we put that? I mean, how are other generations going to look at how we're treating the earth? Yep. So, um, reparations, though, I absolutely agree with you. And also, there are many things with Native Americans. I'm not saying that we don't need to be aware of certain things in our past that we need to. Yes, yes ma'am. So, I am actually I am visiting from Idaho. And how would I vote for you there? Is it the same system? Mark, were we even on, were, are we on the ballot in Idaho, Mark? Mark? Oh, he's looking. Are, are we on the ballot in Idaho? Yes, we absolutely are. And, and, and what's the date of the? Well, anyway, we're on it, so you can look it up. We're on, and the ones that are left are Idaho, Wyoming, Guam, uh, Maryland, D.C., Puerto Rico, Kentucky, possibly. possibly. You don't well know. Columbia. And the ones that I'm visiting we, I, after here, uh, I will also be in Maryland and then in Puerto Rico. Yes. We ha so thank you, ma'am. Are you on the ballot in Hawaii? You should be. We have a Was question. Was I on the ballot? Yeah. yeah. We have a question. We're on the ballot in 40 states. And that's, this whole thing of ballot access is so absurd. And that's where they get you. That's where I get you. I'll give you an example why we weren't on the ballot in Mississippi. Mississippi is a perfect example. It was $5,000 to get on the ballot in Mississippi. So I thought, oh, that's cool. We're going to be on. We can afford that. And then one day, they just decided to make it $25,000. And then what happens, and this is a perfect example of Oregon. So this is what you end up doing in an in a, in a underfunded campaign like ours, underfunded, because once again, if you're not on in the media or every time they mention you, it's long shot. Every time they mention you, apparently this year I was a uh, uh, self-help author. Every possible way they could demean, undercut, she's unserious. By the way, the reason they call me an unserious candidate is because they know how serious I am. And you... <laughs> Right, this has been a pretty serious conversation we've had tonight. But the point is, you end up in a campaign that doesn't have access to really hundreds of millions of dollars that these people are raising, hundreds of millions. Um, you, you say to yourself, well, am I gonna be on the ballot or am I gonna have a, a campaign there? So Oregon is a perfect example. I'm on your ballot, but you, I didn't have a campaign here. I didn't have offices here. I didn't have staff here because you find yourself if, you, if you're not dealing in that stratosphere of corporate donations, you're having to decide, well, I could have a, a campaign here, but then what good will that do? Because we're not on the ballot. So that's what I mean about how rigged it is. It's OK. We're learning. I mean, you're learning. and All of us are learning. I have a young Hi. man with a question here. Hi. Lovely um, to meet you. Thank you. How are you going to, like, do, how are you going to get more, how, are you? I'm nervous, sorry. How are you gonna get more votes than the other presidents like Donald Trump? Well, I'm not. For, first of all, what's happening here, honey, <laughs> is <clears throat> so the way our system works is there are two major political parties, and so they have primaries to determine who the nominee is going to be. And in the Democratic Party, the nominee is going to be our president now, Joe Biden. In the Republican Party, it looks like it's going to be Donald Trump, but we don't know for sure. Then there's something called the Green Party, and they're on 35 ballots, I think, Mark? I think 35, and that's a woman named Jill Stein. And then there's a man running as an independent named Cornell West, and I think he's on four. Uh, Mark, I kind of need you here. Ah, yes. it, 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 is Cornell's on like four ballots or 12 ballots? six ballots, and then there's a man named Robert Kennedy. And I don't know how many Bobby's on. He's on 12. He's on 12. And so that's what's going to happen. And what I'm hoping is I believe in what uh, Franklin Roosevelt said. 
Franklin Roosevelt said that we would not have to worry about a fascist takeover in this country as long as democracy delivers on its promises. First of all, you know, a lot of people said to me over the last year, Marianne, how can you be doing this? Don't you understand the fascists are at the door? And my response every time was, I'm doing this because the fascists are at the door. And fascists should never have gotten so close. And they would not have gotten so close. And I believe that they would not have gotten so close had there been more of delivery on uh, democracy's promises. If democracy was delivering on its promises in this country, we would have universal health care. We would have tuition-free college and tech school. Those college loans wouldn't exist. More people could, like I said, the average person, one salary in the 1970s could support a family of four and so forth. So it, the Democratic Party, I'm an old-fashioned kind of Democrat. I'm a Roosevelt Democrat. I believe that the uh, purpose of a governmental policy should be to help people thrive, and that the pillar of the Democratic Party should be the unequivocal advocacy for the working people of the United States. And I believe the fact that people are so disgusted, people have a right to be disgusted. People have every right to be disgusted, but we can't afford to, to not do anything. Now, I'm not telling you what to do in November. That's really every person. We've got a conundrum on our hands. But where I am right now, uh, I, I am a Democratic candidate, and I'm hoping that if I get enough votes, that I would be a voice where, whether it has to do with ceasefire, whether it has to do with Medicare for all, whether it has to do with tuition-free college and tech school, whether it has to do with the Department of Peace, whether it has to do with the Department of Children, whether it has to do with declaring a climate emergency, that I can have a voice, that I can have a voice, and possibly, if you help me, be heard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let me go to this gentleman because I saw it first. <clears throat> Hello. Um, Hi. Nice to meet you. You too, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so, um, you know, growing up, I, um, I always looked at the law at, like, okay, so this is something to respect and have reverence for. And nowadays, um, it just seems like they're making some kind of laws that are just, like, what are you talking about? And so it's like, I, the basic, basic question is that like, what are your thoughts, or I'm sure you've thought about it, or like what is in your periphery about um, like the Supreme Court, for example, and what they're doing? So can you just speak on that a little bit? Okay, I believe that we have a rogue court. <clears throat> and if you read, uh, there was a book uh, written by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, how strategized this was, the corporate takeover of our Supreme Court. There have been, listen, this is one of the ways I think it's so helpful to read American history. Because, you know, we've had bad times before, everybody. This is not the, this is not the first time we've had some rough times. Now, when you had a real corporate to Supreme Court, what did Franklin Roosevelt said? He threatened to pack it. There's nothing in the Constitution that says it only has to be nine people. Now, what he said uh, was, I'm, if you continue in this direction, I'm going to put more people on the court. They backed up. They backed off, and he didn't. But I, as president, would certainly not be loath to do that. Another article I was reading... <clears throat> Another article I was reading was very interesting. You know, you and I live at a time where the Supreme Court is treated like the final answer. This is relatively new in American history. There are three co-equal branches of government. The Supreme Court is not, you know, the, should not be seen as a final say. That's why President Biden is saying, you give me a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, or we can codify Roe v. Wade. In other words, it doesn't have to be the final word. So... That's what I say. Uh, listen, there have been bad laws in this country before. There have been bad Supreme Court decisions. Listen, look at, Roe, at, at Citizens United. We have to become, as a generation, as intentional about repealing and overturning Citizens United as some people in this country for decades now have been intentional about overturning Roe v. Wade. <clears throat> <clears throat> and... For those of you who are young, like that gentleman said, some things some of us won't live to see, but some of you, those of you who are young, your job, because you'll be the ones to do it, 
we need a, con a constitutional amendment establishing public funding for federal campaigns. That will be your job. That will be yours to do. <clears throat> Hi. Um, forgive me if this is simplistic of your body of work before campaigning. It seems as though there is power in thought is, is a big piece of the body of work of spiritual alignment. So thoughts and alignment uh, is power. Yes. And I know you've met a lot of influential people. It seems that a lot of the things you talked about are about the ways in which there is a philosophy that exploitation is the only way to, to create wealth. And I'm wondering if of the visionaries, including yourself, that you've met in, in the states that you've traveled in, and in your life, is anyone talking about the vast wealth and abundance available if everyone is thriving? Is somebody speaking about and creating that economic model? Because exploitation may not actually be the most wealthy we could be, and you have a body of work of convincing people how to empower their own selves. Many Trumpsters. Many Trumpsters were on that UAW picket line. The American people have figured it out. You don't need a, a few wealthy, influential people. You've got people on the right as well as the left. That's why this is a very pregnant moment. This is a very fertile moment. In fact, a, a lot of Republicans like me. Do you know what I mean? I, I, because a lot of this anti-corporatist message is not only reaching the left, it's reaching the right now. People are figuring it out all over America that the real dichotomy, the real polarity is not left versus right, it's powerful versus powerless. It's those who have <clears throat> capital and ever access to more capital versus those who are just struggling to get by. The issue is not that you have to convince people, you have to give them a candidate that they could vote for so that they could vote the fact that they already know that. And that's why the system suppresses candidates. And candidate suppression is a form of voter suppression. And uh, that's what we've got on our hands. But you know what? Somebody's gonna break through. Somebody's gonna break through. It's not gonna be me, but somebody is. And it ultimately doesn't matter who it is. We all just need to keep pushing at the wall. It's somebody's podcast. It's somebody's local, uh, local job. You know, we're a kind of, um, we are a generation that's kind of spoiled. We're used to 30 minute sitcoms and we get what we want right away, you know? And if you look at American history, it, it, no, it doesn't happen immediately. So you can't let, you know, every election, and that's what I like to think, we're planting seeds, and that's why I'm here. You know, I, you know, you can't make, it's not always about getting exactly what you want. It's not about that. You know, there's a saying that has really guided me. I don't know who originally said it. Be fully invested in an effort and unattached to the results. You know, the idea that that moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Just keep pushing. You know, one of my favorite stories is about the Berlin Wall. If you ask people how the Berlin Wall came down, nobody can actually tell you. Because somebody called somebody at one of the gates, and they got it confused, and they got the instructions wrong, and they opened a gate, and then that gate wasn't supposed to open. Somebody because there's not really one thing you can point, and that was it. It was just that so many people were pushing against that wall. It couldn't stand. And that's <clears throat> systemic injustice. And but I wanna add to that, too. A lot of people on the left, particularly, have this almost disdain for anything religious or spiritual. Um, and they, they have this belief, completely contrary to American history, by the way, that great social justice movements have nothing to do with religion or spirituality. Now, in the abolitionist movement, there were black abolitionists and white abolitionists. Among white abolitionists, the whole movement emerged from the early evangelical churches in New Hampshire. Among the women suffragists, most of them were religious Quakers and let's not forget that Dr. King was a Baptist preacher. So the religious and spiritual circles, faith gives you a faith in that which is as yet unseen. If you only believe in material manifestation, then it is very easy to just kind of have no hope. But if you have a sense that, no, 
Love wins, doesn't win immediately, but love and justice wins and you just keep at it. And whether you even see it isn't even the issue. I read the most incredible book once about, about the greatest achievement in the world. And this author was saying, it was either Henry, I, please forgive me, but I get confused who was Henry James and who was William James. I think Henry James was the fiction and William James was the philosopher. <laughs> Am I right to have it the William James? Okay, he wrote a book. And he wrote a book, he wrote many, but he wrote a book about the, what he referred to as one of the greatest achievements in humanity. And he said one of the greatest achievements is the great Gothic cathedrals of Europe. And he pointed out that they took hundreds of years to build. And that most of the people who were doing all that incredible work knew that they would not live to see the conclusion of the cathedral. And they were doing it for the Virgin Mary. That for their image of that divine feminine and that love that they were building into, that's people who live for the ages. It's not just about only living for yourself. It's also about not only living for your time. We've been so trained to keep it shallow. And I think we're also, we're kind of, Hunger, you know, like I said earlier, Americans were, were hardwired to do big things. We're kind of like wilted flowers because we're not. And I don't, I don't, my impression of the American people is that we're ready to be called to something great. Um, you know, in this room, and I, and I, I, I really want to share this with you. In this room, I haven't seen anybody pick up your phone. Why is that? Because this is what we all really want. We actually want to talk about real things and meaningful. This is what we want. And what I want you to know is that this is what I see everywhere. This is true in Massachusetts. It's true in New Hampshire. It's true in, it, true in South Carolina. It's true in Nevada. It's true in Arizona. It's true in Texas. Yeah, it's true. It's true in this country. It's true in California. The American people are not the problem. And the more we just remember... You know, somebody put it to me really well. This woman said, people think we're powerless. And this, these were her words. We're only, she said, we're actually very powerful once we pierce the illusion of our powerlessness. Right? It's a, and that's why when I look in a room like this, you know, you know, Martin Luther King talked about materially passive, but spiritually active. He said nonviolence. He said we're Passive materially, but we're spiritually active. Where's the work going on? Between here and here. And I, and I see it going on in this room. I see the fact that I see so many people looking concerned. You know, Rilke, there's one of my favorite books, is a book called uh, Letters to a Young Poet. And in that book, he talks about how sometimes you don't have the answer and you have to live the question. Americans are very good with a to-do list. That's our temperament. Just tell us what to do. We'll fix it. Tell us what to do. So this is an uncomfortable moment for us because there's no one giving us bullet points. Do this. Do that. It's, 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 it's not the American temperament. We're ready. Just tell us what to do. Well, we have to think this through. But the fact that we're doing that, this is the good news, and this is why it gives me hope. And this is what we need to do. We just need to think Sometimes wisdom has to marinate. Does that make sense? Okay, in the back there, yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, hi, Miriam. My name's Austin, um, and I'm actually running as a non-affiliated voter in NAV for my Hold house district. Hold on a second, sir, because I didn't hear you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so my name's Austin. I'm actually running as a non-affiliated voter in NAV for my House District over here in House District 46 to become an Oregon legislator. Well, hold on, and then you need to face the room and say that again and say it big. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and so, like you, I'm a... Um, no, I'm a hold on. Introduce yourself and say what you want, because you might have future constituents voters here. Hopefully. So, yeah, my name's Austin Daniel. I'm actually running for House District 46 over here in the Southeast neighborhood. And I'm running as a... <laughs> I'm a non-affiliated voter, so pretty much anyone will be able to vote for me in the November ballot. I'm going to skip the primaries, but um, basically, I, you know, I'm a moderate just like you. I'm spiritually awake. I'm not propagandized. And uh, my question for I you... I wouldn't call me a moderate in the United States. I said I would be a moderate in Europe. Okay. But that's okay. All right, all right. Well, um, my question for you is, 
what, in terms of what's worked for you, um, what advice do you have, not just for me, but all political candidates who are awake and aware in terms of uh, trying to wake up the uh, people from the propaganda spell that they're under so that we can all unify and vote for the right candidates into office? <laughs> A mistake I have made is caring too much about people who didn't agree with me. And every moment when I was worried about someone who didn't agree with me, I could have spent organizing with people who do. <clears throat> because you know what? If you look at the polls, the American people my agenda, the American people are a little bit left of center in poll after poll. If you, I already talked about gun policy, tuition-free college and tech school, Medicare for all. The political media industrial complex would have you think we're in a different place than we actually are. It's all part of the gaslighting, right? Okay, somebody over here, and I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to keep you longer, you know, I don't want to abuse your generosity, so let's get right to it. Anybody in this group? It, yeah, yes, sir. <clears throat> We can share. Um, so I love what you said about um, kind of like sowing seeds and thinking of the future in this way. Um, but then like, I kind of want to speak for people my age and my friends and stuff. Like we wake up in the morning and go on Instagram and there's videos of the genocide and it's been that for months. And then like we have politicians or ads with politicians like Joe Biden being like, Hey guys, I'm gonna need you to do one last time for me. And I just don't know if it's realistic anymore. What realistic? For, to expect young people who are exposed to so much propaganda about things like, you know, the war in Gaza. Well, and if you really care about the people of Gaza, <laughs> if you really care about the people of Gaza, he's left wing compared to Trump or Bobby. So is it about performative I'm upset or is it about I want to elect for someone who would change policy? Now the president has gone way too slow uh, for me as well as you. I'm baffled uh, by his unwillingness to say no to Bibi Netanyahu in certain circumstances. But once again, uh, you have to say, well, what would Trump do? And Trump has made it clear. What he would say to Israel is get in there, take care of it, and take care of it fast. And Bobby as well. So your choice if you want, is to sit it out. And then you, uh, that, that does no good for the people of Gaza. Because if you just sit it out, all you're doing is helping elect someone who will be much worse for them. I know we had okay. some questions back here. This man and then and this nice sweater back here. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. OK, can we do this gentleman and then? OK. <clears throat> So I've quoted you so many times. Thank you. Uh, my favorite quote, and I'm not even sure I can do it justice right now, but our greatest fear is not that we are in inadequate, mm -hmm. but that we're powerful beyond measures. Thank you. And my question is that I see a very courageous woman standing in front of us today. Thank you. Uh, for repeatedly coming back. And Thank being you. willing to put yourself out there the way you are. And what you just stated there made it even more solid that not caring about what people who don't support you or your views, right, but caring about the people who do. So I'm one of those person that I'm wondering about how many other people experience this disillusion in the world that we live in. And how can I be courageous? What can I do? Really, truly, what would okay. you say to all these people to gather our courage and to do something different? Because you are the underdog, you get that. <clears throat> So I'm in the face of the underdog. I want to support you. But at the same time, I say to myself, am I just shooting myself in the foot? Well, how, he's already won the nomination. So Joe Biden doesn't need your vote. You know, he doesn't need your vote. And this was a primary anyway. So there was nothing about voting for me at any point that was helping Donald Trump. It's a primary. But listen, I have to say something, guys. And I say this to you as someone who's just been through a really brutal year. You don't know what it's like to wake up every morning to insults and lies, and it's, it's rough. But you know what? Toughen up, everybody. <laughs> Toughen up, buttercups. You 
toughen up, buttercups. Let me tell you what I'm aware of. Do you know how many countries there are in this country, this world, who, I'm a woman. If I got up and said a fraction of what I have said today in criticism of my government, I would be hauled out of here by a policeman, I would possibly be tortured, I would possibly be imprisoned and or killed. So we, yeah, it's, it's not working. And it should not have gotten as bad as it's gotten. And it's not going to unravel, you know, it's not going to all get better in four years. And uh, it's going to take a serious, serious season of repair. But we can at least get started. And cynicism becomes an excuse for not helping. Right? And we have to, we can't coddle that in ourselves. And we can't, can't coddle that in each other. You know, when you say that, like, if you're really thinking about the person in Gaza, then you're not thinking about your disillusion. You know what I'm saying? If you really care about people who are suffering because they don't have health care or because of anything in American domestic or foreign policy, it can't just be about you. I'm sorry. We have, we have just, we've, we've, we act too precious. And when we talk about it's this illusion, still, as bad as it is in some ways, still look at the freedoms that we have. Let's look at freedom of, of just the fact that we're here tonight. There are some countries where a policeman could come in here and say, break it up. You know, rather the system lets you talk and then they look at me and they go, we'll handle you later, Ms. Williamson. But, but it's not, <laughs> you know, physical violence and all that. Do you know what I'm saying? We've got to, we've got to say that to one another. Do you know what I mean? I know what they did to Bernie. I know what they've done to me. I know, but, you know, there's a point you have to process your pain, but there's a certain point where the processing becomes spewing. The process becomes self-indulgent. And uh, we've got to be grown-ups right now. Does that make sense, sir? Thank you. <clears throat> and you know what? Let me tell you something. If the people who really feel this way actually meet with Alicia, on Thursday night, is that what you said? Yep. Me with Alicia and really work with Alicia and really uh, go to my YouTube and send out those videos and talk to your friends. You could do something that the night of the election in Oregon would make you go, hey. and you'd feel real good about yourself. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I don't know what's going on. With okay, and then a, that gentleman, this, and then I think we should probably wrap yes, it up. Yes, okay. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Marianne, uh, thank you for being here. Um, there is people who are writing. Sarah Augustine, I don't know if you know of her, but she wrote so that we and our people will, may live. And she's saying a lot of what you're saying. Um, but most of all, I want to thank you for reminding us of the still small voice, because that is the power. That is the power. You know, um, and thank you for that comment you made um, when you were asked, what would you do about Trump? And I think you said, I'd love him. And I think that is so incredibly powerful. And they're in. Well, what Martin Luther King said was, God said, I have to love my enemies. He didn't say, I have to like them. <laughs> right? And, uh, I, I did, one of the reasons I'm sad I won't be the nominee is because I had my nickname picked out for him. <laughs> I figured he'd call me Mad Marianne and I would call him Donald Darling. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Darling, I saw your tweet this morning. Must have been the Adderall, huh? <clears throat> Hi, Marianne. Hi. I love you. Love you too, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask for prayer for the veterans in the United States, and I'm a veteran also, and I have depression, and I want to find a way to focus my energy and to serve beyond my fear, and I want to learn to have courage. Okay. All right. So I want you to look at the room, and I, I really believe that I can say on behalf of everyone here right, that uh, there's deep appreciation here for you for the fact that you served as a veteran. And I know that you're probably not the only person here, actually, who feels depression, anxiety, concern. And I think that uh, it's reasonable to assume that there's a lot of love coming at you right now. 
Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dan Lynn. I grew up here in Portland uh, for my whole life. Uh, I live in Montevilla. Um, I'm just letting you know that uh, there is an opportunity in Portland to, uh, to back up the idea of public financing because the uh, city council is being, uh, is on rank voting this year. Ranked choice voting. Uh -huh. Ranked choice voting. <clears throat> and there is an opportunity for public finance. Fabulous. What I'm going to ask you to do is to send $5. I need $5, five, $250, five dollar donations to my son's campaign for city council. His name is David Lynn. David Lynn, L-I-N-N. Great. Great. Five dollars in if favor look, of public financing. Uh, is there a URL you could give us for your? Is, does he have a website for his campaign? Um, Lynn for Portland. Okay, so, uh, Lynn for Portland. I hope all of you will look into that. Of course, ranked choice voting is great. Alaska has it. Maine has it, and it's the kind of thing more states will get, and then I think it'll be like domino. So I'm all for that ranked choice voting. You know, it's 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 happening. Okay, I don't. I, I, uh, uh, please be very, very quick with your question. I'll be very, very quick with my answer because I, I know some people is okay. getting late. So, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> okay. I don't even know if it's really a question. Um, I love you. But <clears throat> there are pockets of people like us all over. That I have no doubt. Yep. Um, we are extremely powerful people. That's that correct. I have no doubt. But maybe, I guess my question is, is it a matter of getting somebody like you into infiltrating this horrible, broken, corrupt system, or do we need a new fucking system? I think the systems, the syst there are two systems. First of all, our constitution and so forth. I think it's brilliant. It's obviously, it always needs to be better. That's what amendments are for. I think if ever there was a time to actually be dedicated uh, to a system of laws and the one that we have, this is it. This is not a time to say, just break down the system. The system that we have to be concerned about is that political media industrial complex. That we definitely need to smash that machine. But there's a big difference between disrupting and smashing that and disrupting and smashing, uh, the, let's say, the constitutional system. This is actually a time to be the, the, the revolutionary of this moment needs to be not only committed to radical repair, but also committed to a real love for this country. You know, we have to be, <clears throat> and the only, the only answer to all this is a nonviolent revolution. The only answer to all this is nonviolence. And, uh, and we'll make it. Listen, I wanna tell you something. For those of you who are progressives, you know, not only was it that the mainstream uh, you know, blocked me, so did a lot of independents. So did a lot of the left. Uh, I was made fun of. I was, look at someone like Norm Finkels. I mean, people who came at me, some of the dirtiest. Listen, if everybody in this country who believes in what my agenda is about and knew about it had given $2, we, we would have had the money necessary to stay as a kind of campaign that we needed. So. It, 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 we, you know, we you just have to keep going, but you have to, you have to look. Whether it was this gentleman who talked, whether it's David Lynn, we we all have to get involved. And there's there's a point at which, you know, it's like if you're, if you're, you know, when you look at brilliant athletes, right? Like a brilliant tennis player, or you know, let's say t tennis, okay? Like a real pro tennis player. And sometimes a really pro tennis player drops a ball makes a mistake that they haven't made since they were a child. They don't have the time to waste a fraction of a second saying, oh shit. They have to be present with what is in this moment. We don't have the time to indulge anything other than actually using the system that we have. Remember, the problem is that the political media industrial complex as it now exists does not honor real democratic principle. And we, we have to honor real democratic principle. Beyond that, 
you will know what to do. So I'm very humbly requesting that one of the things you do is vote for me uh, between May 1st and May 21st. <clears throat> and remember, no president, even if I were president, no president has a magic wand. It, we have three co-equal branches of government. And the president, depending on who the House and who the Senate is. Like I said, it can't be just one person. It's not 100 people. It's got to be all of us. It's got to be all of us asking, what have I done today? And what can I do in our own communities, in our own families, whatever it is? And, and, and I hope that I leave you feeling that, you know, if you look at all the religious principles, there was a crucifixion, and then there was a resurrection. In the Old Testament, there was the slavery in Egypt, and then there was the promised land. And sometimes you have to, you have to note the crucifixion. You have to note the, the slavery in the promised land. Otherwise, you're not in transcendence. You're in denial. So you have to look at those shadows. We have to look at those problems. But you know what? That's what adults do. And in my work, what I have seen over and over, you know, Oscar Wilde once talked about somebody in one of his books. He said, he was a deeply shallow person. Uh, I have known people who lived their lives in a very shallow way, who were just distracted by the most ultimately silly things. And then the doctor said, it's cancer, or your child has cancer, or something equivalent to that in terms of disaster. And I've watched that person who, until that moment, lived in very shallow ways. Within five minutes, layers of ultimately unimportant things just fell away. And I've seen that person within two minutes become a very responsible adult and lean into the doctor. What do we have to do? And that's where I think we are. A lot of people think Americans are apathetic. I don't. I think Americans just kind of can't believe where we are. <laughs> but Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. <clears throat> having, having faith in God is ultimately having faith in one another. Let's have faith in one another. Let's have faith in what's possible. And I also want to leave you with one story. I know a woman. She was born in Lebanon and raised in Norway. And she's an award-winning documentarian. And she does documentaries about serious things like women in the Congo and some of the most serious, you know, situations in the world. And she spends time at some very high-level conferences and with truly some of the great, you know, powerful leaders of this world. And she told me something that has stayed with me. She said she was at one of those conferences and she has privy to these world leaders. And she was asking all these world leaders of democratic, democratic countries, what is it that keeps you up at night? What is it that really scares you? What is it that makes you the most like, oh my God, what will we do? What is it that keeps you up at night? She said, I was very surprised by the answer I got almost every time. I was surprised too, but I leave it with you. The question she got from almost every leader was, what will we do if America goes down? That's what a big responsibility lies in our hands. And I share with, me, with you my faith we can do this. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Thank you, Portland. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.